Welcome to USAFootball.com, uh, live TV, I don't know what we want to call it, but we're going to talk about the championship game in the Pac-12, USC versus Stanford. We have, we're supposed to have four, actually, we have one coming. walking in here right now. <laughs> We are live. I actually gave her a little warning, you know, show up a little early this time. This is not my fault. It's wow. not her fault. It's totally my fault. <laughs> All right. Well, well, she's here, so we're going to give her a little round of applause. Thank you. 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 She had a meeting in LA and she was like, I have something to give you. I'll meet you before you do your little podcast thing. I was like, sure, <laughs> but you have to be here by 1120 or I'll be late. She shows up at 1135 um, to give me a Christmas tree for my apartment. So, nice. yeah. So we blame mom. Blame mom. All right. Well, anyway, I'll give you guys a little background while no, Keely's getting no. set up there of uh, what we're doing. Uh, we try to do these every week, normally on Thursday during the season. We'll kind of figure out what the schedule will be during the off season. But since it's a short week, two short days till USC plays uh, Stanford up in uh, Levi's Stadium. So we want to do a little live show, kind of get your thoughts and comments, and we'll all talk about it. So we got most of the USCFootball.com crew here. So from uh, your right to left, we have Chris Trevino over there. How's it going? Say hi, Chris. Hi. Yes, Chris, you got it. <laughs> cool. Shotgun sprawling in the middle. Hola. Como estas? Muy bien. He does Gracias. speak English too. <laughs> and, uh, That's the extent of my Spanish, actually. Our latecomer, Keely Yor. So sad. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to be like 20 minutes early today. Just, just sad. I'm here. Hello. I'm pretty impressed that you sure. left. You only took you 25 minutes to get here? No, it took no, it took me, and I met her in like off the 405 exit. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, you met so her somewhere. She, yeah, so whatever. Nice. Well, sorry, Keely's mom. I know. I know your sister like follows us and stuff. She like does. Her. So does my mom. I don't so. know. Oh, she does. She'll see this later and be like, send me an angry text. Why did Not you blame really. me? She's What's your nice. mom's name? Catherine. Catherine. Catherine, you're. Tisk tisk tisk. This is hilarious. Yep. Shame <laughs> on you, mom. Well, we wanted to talk obviously about the championship game uh, today. We've done. I've done. I don't know how many. Like three or four podcasts this week already. Keely and Shotgun will have a podcast coming up uh, a little afterwards. I think we're gonna get some. Some lunch, some bye week, post bye week, uh, lunch. USC practiced a couple of times. We got to watch that, so maybe we'll go over that stuff uh, a little bit. Heading into the championship game, we'll all be there. Plus, uh, plus Dan Weber. So we're on Facebook Live. Go to the little comment section and put your comments, questions, and things like that. And Keely will. Now that she's here, she can relay those to us. <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> and we'll talk about. It. This is the first time we've had all four. Uh, all four of us. It's true. Not true. Chris was off camera once. He was off camera oh, once. But still. That's true. That we've all been on. Yeah. Uh, Historic. Yeah. <laughs> that is fair. And I got some different camera angles to play with. I can just put you guys on. I can just get rid of myself so wow. that I can pick my nose or something right now. <laughs> um, let us know if you guys have any, uh, if there's any audio problems or anything. I think we're all set on that front. Uh, but it's nice to all be in the same room. Um, Maybe we'll do talk a little bit about practice this week first. Right. Uh, <laughs> talking about practice. Chris, maybe we'll start with you. Anything kind of stand out from you, injury front, or anything of, of what you saw this uh, last couple of days of practice? Stephen Carr looks like Stephen Carr of uh, old. He's got that burst back, scored two really nice touchdowns on uh, Monday. Had a really nice run on Tuesday yesterday. So he's looking like the same explosive back we saw you know, early in the year. Same guy we saw against Stanford. So I think that could be a huge difference uh, on Friday. Yeah, it's funny. You, you kind of forget, like, that was week two. So I went back and rewatched the USC Stanford game on uh, the Pac 12 Network's 60 uh, minute deal. I, that's the best. Like, if you want to rewatch a football game, you're not doing like shotgun style where you need to like count players <laughs> and stuff. You just want to watch the game again. 60 minutes on the Pac 12 Network, if you can get that, is awesome. And you forget how good. Stephen Carr was in that game, and he yeah. was. So and we really haven't seen, since he got the injury, we really haven't seen him be that way. So if he, I, you know, obviously a huge coup for USC if uh, he can come back like that. How about you, Shock? Anything that kind of stood out? I know you were one day. What, anything that stood out to you? Uh, not necessarily from practice. I mean, from talking to the guys, just everybody said, you know, how refreshing it was to have the bye week and how, and I talked to Cam Smith, and he's like, it, it was 
you know, like a reset button for them because they were able to heal up, but also get away from football for a minute. Because they've been been out there for what? I mean, this is week 13 right now. They had been going for four or five weeks before that with training camp. So to get a refresher and just go home and, and see family and, and as he put it, I got to do some things I like to do, <laughs> which I was like, okay, that's kind of a strange wording of it. But uh, just the fact that they were able to get away and, you know, able to you know, relax a little bit and, and then come back and get started on Stanford tape again uh, after the break, I think that was really big for the team, just the way that everyone kind of talked about it this week. Yeah, you know, I think we've all been sort of critical at times of, like, practice schedules, maybe not practicing hard enough, certainly two years ago at the Holiday Bowl. There were some circumstances there where he fired half the coaching staff and all that kind of stuff. But in this case, I just kind of feel like, you know, 12 weeks in a row, I'm not going to begrudge Clay Helton and staff for, like, just giving the players a, a week off. Now, if they come out and they play crappy against Stanford, they're going to be second guess. But I'm not going to second guess it right now. I think it's the thing. Any, any thoughts on that, Keely, or anything that stood out to you? Yeah, no, I think that was a big deal for them just to get that rest, especially for guys like Christian Rector, who told me yesterday that he actually split his hand open against UCLA, so he got stitches and was able to actually heal during that week, which is helpful for USC's defense, especially now that Porter Gustin's not going to be in the game on Friday. Um, but just even talking to Nico Fowler, they liked having the opportunity to be football fans. Like, they got to watch yeah. Stanford Notre Dame, um, Wazoo, UW. So they liked just being able to, like, see family, chill, kind of get – Get some rest where they're not burnt out on football. I mean, like, I was talking to Shotgun, and we're, we noticed we were kind of burnt out on football a little yeah. bit, and we're not even playing, you know? <laughs> so I, I know for them it was a, a big deal to get that rest, and hopefully clarity, if you're USC, you want to them to be fresh for Friday, so. Yeah, that, I, I felt the same way. I was like, man, I needed the bye week, too. It's yeah. like, we're not doing anything that hard. We stand around, watch practice. You know, we do a lot of work or whatever, but it was kind of nice to just, like, oh, I don't have to go to practice this week. Um that was different. Uh, it, talking to some of the guys, you don't realize like they've never had a stretch like that in their lives where mm -hmm. not just 12 straight weeks, but you're talking about fall camp and all that stuff too. Um, it's basically like four months where they didn't really have more than two, you know, a day off in a row. And that's just bizarre. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that's really safe to put like college students through that kind of the rigors of that. But Safety. Who cares about <laughs> safety. that? The Pac-12 well, doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but th and it, so the, here's the, the, the issue, though. So the late bye week is, is rare. We've seen schools that happen a couple of times. Um, horrible. It's not going to happen next year in the, in the schedule, which is great. But five Pac-12 teams had a November bye week. So that's a late bye week, obviously, right? Um, three of those teams have lost, and Oregon's the only team that won. So Washington State last week was coming off a bye. They got boat raced. They looked terrible. Um, who was the other one? Uh, I think Cal lost their bye week, and then UCLA. Uh, Colorado. Colorado had a bye week for the UC Colorado. <laughs> well, that was, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so Colorado played Utah in the uh, whatever cup they call that. And I forget what it is. It, not the Territorial Cup. That's the, uh, the Arizona game. Colorado played like crap against Utah. They were down 28 nothing to start. So I'm not, you know, November bye weeks not been so good so far and usc obviously has the the latest one yeah also just reminder if you have any questions put them in the the comments bar and we will answer them yeah little the comments the motion comments bar this is the comments bar. the comments bar <laughs> chris you looking forward to the trip up north i am uh my first pac-12 championship game i don't know how many guys you've been to well, we got one, one. that's yeah. it yeah. okay ago. not as many as i thought we all got to see the christian mccaffrey show yeah <laughs> As, as Chris Hawkins described him, the white Reggie Bush. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Dude, Hawkins had the whole, I mean, everyone in the media was around him. Besides me. I gave up yeah. on that. There's too many people. <laughs> I mean, it's one of his last scrums. You can't miss the Chris Hawkins scrum. I'll talk to him after the game. Okay, How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Has he been one of your favorite people to talk to, Chris, do you think? Or? He will be missed as a <laughs> guy to get quotes from. He's very honest. He's very thoughtful. And, just, and he's candid sometimes. And he just, he's the best. Yeah, there was a long discussion about who would be the guy to replace him because he kind of replaced Sua Cravens. Yeah. I mean, he was around when Sua was there, but he was not the big contributor that Sua was, obviously, and you know wasn't playing full-time. And then when he took over, he was the guy to go to. Now the question is, who will remain, especially on the defensive side, uh, that will be the talker for the future? There's Probably not a Jack lot Jack. of talkers on this team. Jack-Jack could be I one. I can see Jack-Jack mat maturing into the more media-friendly 
guy, maybe. Yeah, I mean, but just like as far as vocal leaders go, like we get this kind of question a lot. Um, I mean, you can say whatever you want about Zach Banner, but there was at least like a voice there. And like right now, you have one offensive captain. Sam Darnold is not a stand up on the table kind of dude and, and tell everyone what he's thinking. He'll pull you aside and say something, but you don't really have that kind of vocal leadership on the offensive side and you lose Chris Hawkins. I'm not sure how much there's going to be this whole team next year. Like someone's got to be like the loud dude. And you lose Jim Nawosu, who's, who's not a great speaker in the media. He's really quick. So he gets his point yeah. across to players because he can be really loud in that way. Um, but he's not the, the quote machine that Chris Hawkins is. But you're going to lose him as well as a, as a vocal leader in the locker room. Cam Smith, the question mark there, if he decides to come back or not. You know, you have your three captains. You could lose, you know, all, you could potentially lose all four of your captains. And three of them are your vocal leaders on defense. So that would put a big question mark uh, on both sides of the ball about who would be the, the leadership roles that would be coming. Mm -hmm. Before we uh, jump in some of the questions and stuff, um, maybe we get like a update. Maybe we start with you, Chris. What do you think about the injury uh, updates from this week? It seems like team relatively healthy. What's what's the latest? I mean, yeah, relative to past couple of weeks, pretty healthy. I mean, Rasheem Green and Tyler Petit have been the two kind of big ones limited with those uh, shoulder injuries. Um, I think both are expected to play. Um, just been getting rehab work and just kind of off to the sideline most of the stuff. Um, uh, the specialists are getting healthy. Chase McGrath practiced two times this week, which I think Helton said he hadn't done since he got injured. I believe that was the Arizona week. And then uh, Reed Budrovich has been rehabbing his shoulder, um, and he's expected to uh, start at punter and kickoff on Friday. So I might be missing some. Yeah, so. pretty healthy. No, no Port Augustine is like the big one, but he's just been a – he, he's basically put pads on how many times since, like, um, the... Yeah, he's I, practiced zero times <laughs> since the Stanford game. Right. But he put pads on... Zero times. But he put pads on for the Texas, Texas game. game because and he for played the Arizona in the State. Texas game. That's it. Then he put pads on for the Arizona State game because he played in that game. And, and overplayed in that game. Yes. So he played too quickly against Texas, is what we're saying. And then played too long. He went past his pitch count against Arizona State. Um, but they, I think they kind of needed him against Texas. Like, do they, like, if he doesn't play that first half of the game where he got two sacks, does USC beat Texas? Like, I don't know. Is it worth not having him for basically the rest no, of the season? No, no. I mean, but, yeah, but, 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 like, if you lose to Texas, like, you're derailing the season. So if you would say, okay, you can play Port Augustine for a half and you win Texas, you beat Texas otherwise. Derailing the se season? If you lose to Texas and you beat Washington State, but you're not, like, I'm, I'm assuming really you're not matter, beating Washington State at that point. You're, I mean, both of those games were, you know, one play goes different, and either one of the games could okay. be different. So you could argue that um, USC would lose to Texas if Porter doesn't play, but then maybe they beat him if he comes back against Washington State. I mean, I, I, you could argue that. But, and then he would be healthy for other games, potentially, because he wouldn't have re-injured his foot in the Texas game, and he wouldn't come back and play too much against Arizona State. So you could say that, you know, he would have been back... And then you have him against Notre Dame, and you have a more experienced uh, edge rusher playing the the zone read where they really struggled in that first half with Christian Rector. So maybe I don't think things have changed. Turns, I don't think he changes a 35-point loss. Well, that was definitely a snowball game. <laughs> that was a snowball game. Everything started going bad, and it just continued, and it got bigger and bigger. And then it snowballed, and then there was an avalanche, too. So, you know, it was a lot of snow. A lot of snow. Not the kind of snowball game that you normally it's could get. cold in Notre there. Dame, yeah. you know. Good analogy. Yeah. Nice. Do I just we... think it's weird. It's kind of, I feel like it's been more underrated than it should be, the whole Port Augusta thing. And I think part of that is because Helton's been like, oh, he's day to day. But it's yeah. like days to days to days to days. Like, it's not, you know, I don't know. I feel like if he had been like, oh, he's going to be out for months, people there would be more uproar on right. how he was used improperly. I mean, you have to go day to day in the months, I guess. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> You said some fibbing was going on. The ghost of Port Augustine is lurking somewhere. You love the ghost of Port Augustine. The ghost of Port Augustine. He just shows up for games every once in a while, and you're like, wait, where did this guy come from? He hasn't practiced in forever. He plays, and they're like, oh, wait, he's hurt again. The ghost disappeared. Yeah, before the ASU game, if people don't remember, he wasn't practicing. We can go to Tuesday, Wednesday practices, which are the main ones where there's you know more contact and stuff. He wasn't even there at those practices. Somehow on Thursday, where we're not allowed to be there, 
he got some reps, and, and Clay Helton's like, oh, play him 15 plays or something, which was like, what? Like, he wasn't even wasn't even on the field, and then he plays. Yeah, the question was like, the question was asked to, to Clay, I was like, hey, will he be able to get back by the next week, maybe by, you know, this game or this game? He's like, well, he might be available for 15 to 20 plays this week. Like, what? What What'd you just say? <laughs> like, you, you're talking about the same guy we haven't seen in a month? Yeah. I mean, is that, are we, are we talking it. about the same person here? And then he shows up and he plays. He played pretty well. He just played too much, it seemed like. Uh, I mean, if you're going to set up pitch count or play count, then stick with it. I mean, usually that play count is devised by someone, maybe like a medical staff in coordination with the coaching staff. So, hey, that'd probably be smart to stick with it instead they pushed him way beyond that. I think it was tw- he was supposed to play tw- 15 to 20 plays. I think he played like 43 in that one. So it's just unnecessary overload in a game that you were dominating at halftime. Yes, you didn't need to play him in the second half or anything like that, um, which I, I, don't, I don't quite understand. We had heard kind of, you know, rumors or whatever, like after the ASU game, like he's done. Like he's not going to be coming back. So maybe for the bowl game or something. So I'm not shocked that even for the Pac-12 championship game after a week, he's still not able to play. That's kind of like the rumors, like, yeah, he played too much. And not that it's really been addressed, but that's, I don't know, it's not, not really shocking to me. I don't know, Chris, what do you have, any thoughts? Uh, well, on the injury front, Christian Rector's back starting in that predator spot. He's back up uh, opposite of uh, Uchenna uh, over Jordan. So he's getting healthier, and Clay Helton mentioned that yesterday, that he's going to be able to do more stuff on Friday. So that's good. Uh, for defense. Yeah, I think that's important, too, because of who you're playing. You're playing against Stanford. You know, it's better to have a bigger body type on that edge rather than Jordan ISF. Jordan ISF played really good in the UCLA game. And they tried to run a couple of uh, misdirection plays, and he stuffed them both out uh, You know, for, for four, five, six, seven-yard losses. Uh, so I thought he played really well. And you know, they've, they've mixed, mixed and matched with those two guys, using Rector more in pass rush situations. I think it's important in this game with the fact that Stanford's going to want to put 42 tight ends on the field at one time to have a bigger body guy that can play with his hand on the ground rather than uh, uh, ESFO who may get pushed around a little bit by some of those bigger blockers. Let's put a picture of Josh Fatu up. Um, he seems like he's a lot better, too, after the, uh, the car wreck. Um, think he could, you guys think he could be a big factor in this one? They need him to be. And, yeah. I mean, Rasheem Green – has been such a warrior throughout the entire season, playing through injuries and different things. Yeah. When he wasn't able to go, Malik Dorton came in and, and played that spot and stepped up. But re- you lose a lot when you lose Rasheed because then, I mean, they had been using Malik Dorton as uh, the backup nose tackle over Brandon Peely the last couple games. So when you lose Rasheed Green, you've, you're forced to use Malik Dorton in a position. So then that bumps up Liam Jimmins. Liam Jimmins had to play more snaps in this game. So you, you, you see the, you know, kind of the cascade effect of where the, where the ball uh, or where the snaps have to go um, when Rasheem Green goes out. And he's been such a phenomenal player in the middle of the line. He does not get enough credit for everything he does up there, uh, playing at you know, 300, 315, uh, and kind of battling one of those guys, playing at kind of a hybrid defensive end, defensive tackle role. I think he's just been huge for him. So getting him healthy will be really big, and uh, having him be able to play in this game I think is huge. Keely, we got uh, we got questions. Let's get into it. Let's jump um, in. John says, "Will the Trojans show anything new for the game?" I'm sure they will. <laughs> I mean, they've been working on some uh, stuff for you know several weeks that we have not seen go into games. Um, so you know, the, maybe this is the time for those games. You know, you have certain plays that you're like, "Okay, we got the look. This is when we're going to run it." Um, and you know, maybe that's some of the stuff we'll see this game. Uh, against Stanford, Stanford's a pretty disciplined team. It's not like uh, they fall for a bunch of misdirection or um, trick plays usually. But, you know, this Stanford defense is not quite the same Stanford defense as we've seen in the past. So I think one of the things is just running the ball well on first and second down uh, up the middle. I mean, that's, you know, they were able to get big chunks of yardage the first game. I, like Ryan, watched the 60-minute version to, to recap what it – and you see, you know, some big holes. And sometimes you saw Vianne Tomavayo and Chris Brown six, seven yards down the field making blocks. And I think that's a big key in the front rather than bringing out a bunch of new stuff and new formations they haven't seen. I think it's just executing what you got. Yeah. That was Chris Brown's, like, emergence onto the scene. Yeah, that was Chris Brown opening up that one hole for Stephen Carr that, that literally all four of us could have run through at the same time <laughs> and still picked up 20 yards together. Even though... Ryan or Keeley might have fell behind. Excuse you. Wait. 
I would have got my 20 yards first, is what I'm I saying. I don't understand So you say Chris and you have better speed than me and Keely. Well, obviously, even well, though I run in slow like motion. Eight year, so don't <laughs> even. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Matthew says, is, is this the most healthy the team has been since week one? You want to jump on this one, Chris? What do you think? I would say so. Uh, if I recall, I mean, outside of the Porter coming back for the Arizona State game, I thought they were pretty good then. Uh, if I recall, no, they didn't have Iman, obviously. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say everyone feels much better playing. The coaches are saying, hey, they look a little bit faster on defense. They look a bit faster on offense. It's nice to get players back. They can practice with a little bit more depth since their backup guys are also getting over those bumps and bruises. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that they're the healthiest they've been since yeah. the start of the season. I think Viani not being in there, uh, you know, obviously that's a big one. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, like, is, you know, is this fair to have a bye week before the championship game? Probably uh, not. Really? Is it like reparations for like what happened earlier in the season? Probably. Yeah. It evens it out a little bit. But I would have loved to see Washington State have to go on the road to Seattle and then yeah. come back in on the road. Like it just kind of like that would have been more fair. But yeah. Stanford they just have to drive down the street. <laughs> but if you like the body blow theory, they did have to play Notre Dame, and uh, that was a tough game until the fourth quarter when Stanford opened it up. And USC's had key injuries pretty much in every game. I mean, it, yeah. it, Porter Gustin's the only one this game, but you, you look at, you know, like the Texas game, he leaves that game. Um, someone else got hurt. I can't remember. Uh, Rasheem Green got hurt in that game. The Cal game, you didn't have Ronald Jones. The Wazoo game, you started off kind of healthy, and then you lose, you know, everybody. You lose Toa Lobendon the day before to a staff infection. And then every since then, it's been, you know, there's been one or two guys, it seems like, every week. So I, I would agree with that. This is probably the healthiest they've been. But, side note, I'll be interesting to see uh, Chris Brown because he came out, he couldn't even walk to the tunnel after the UCLA game, but then he practiced fully this week. Um, and he said it was just, it's something that's happened before to him. It's his back acting up on him. So I don't know if that's something that once you're getting full contact, if somehow that will like re it or something. So it will be interesting to see if Chris Brown is 100% throughout the game. I mean, they said it was just back spasms. So a lot of times with back spasms, it, it can just seize up on you yeah. and... You basically uh, lay down on the, on the floor. I remember we had a basketball player in high school who would get it, and he would just lay down. Like, and that was the only thing. You put a heating pad on his back, and hopefully it stops. Wow. Yeah. There's really nothing else you can do with it. Like, you can try to massage it and stuff uh, during the off time to you know, keep those muscles from kind of clenching up on you. But sometimes it just, out of nowhere, it would just pop up, and you, you're, there's nothing really you can do about it during the, the, the game itself. During the, the latter part of uh, Larry Bird's career, he had to lie on the ground a lot doing that, so... Um, I mean, see a superstar like that be debilitated by just having to lie on the ground. It's uh, back's not are fun. Back injury is no fun. Yeah, no, not a lot of injuries are fun, but backs <laughs> particularly. Pretty, yeah, I don't know if it's too early for this, but Sean says shotguns prediction question mark. He was on the money with the last one I heard. Were you? Yes. Was I don't he on the think money? you were. What was this prediction? I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I was. I don't think he was, right. Sean. Come on. <laughs> Bring the receipt, Sean, if you're going to say he's right, so I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, there was a streak of like four weeks in a row where I was like three points or a score off every game. That is true. This is such a revisionist That is history. not, no, for like the ASU, Arizona, and Colorado games, I think I was like mm. right on. Um, and the thing is, like I thought about this last night, I was like, I really don't know. I said bro. to Keely yesterday at practice, I was like, yeah, they'll come out and Stanford will get the win. I mean, Stanford will get ahead and USC will play catch up and then they'll lose at the end. And then I said, or USC is really fresh and they come out and they can dominate up front and then win the game. It's like, I don't, the, the, the bye week changes so much. Yeah. If, it, if they were playing the, the week after the UCLA game, I'd say they'll lose for sure. Uh, yeah. But but I think just the fact that there's so much, re, they're refreshed now and, you know, fresh legs can be such a huge advantage um, that I think it could be. Uh, a big boost here. So now you, now you go to, okay, they're going to be in better shape. They're going to be in better condition. Now you go schematically. Is David Shaw going to break out something new or something that will fool USC? And, then, uh, you know, one of the players yesterday said this Stanford team looks completely different, completely different than what they looked like previously. So they're playing with confidence. K.J. Costello, uh, especially on, like, third downs, you know, they, yeah. they feel like they're going to get them. Instead of, you know, you see the, the shoulder slump a little bit, like, oh, it's third and eight. Hopefully, you know, somebody can catch a jump ball on the outside because that's the only way we're picking up first down. Uh, I, I feel like they have a lot more confidence now with Cajun Costello at, at quarterback. So 
I'm kind of just kind of like, I don't really know what's going to happen in this game. This one could go any number of ways. Weird thing about the Notre Dame game, Stanford only converted two third downs out yeah, of 11. 18% conversion rate. Yeah, they were 0 for 7 through the first three quarters. Like, they didn't convert a third down to the fourth quarter. And they won the game. Yeah. Meanwhile, Notre Dame converted, like, less than half. How weird is that? And it's also because, you know, the number of possessions you get. You just don't get a ton of possessions yeah. with yeah. with Stanford. Uh, so you have to take advantage of those. And that's what Ryan, you know, tweeted yesterday, you know, re-watching the game. USC was really good in the first half in particular uh, of taking advantage of every possession, kind of putting the onus on that Stanford offense to keep up with USC. I mean, besides the one interception in the first half, uh, you know, they what was it, five possessions? They scored five four possessions, touchdowns. Five possessions, four touchdowns, yeah. And then the, the other one was interception. So you get 28 points in the first half. I think it was 28-17 going in the second half or early in the second half. That forces that Stanford defense, I mean offense, to try to do more than just grind out three or four yards every run. Yeah, if it was 17-14 or something Stanford at the half, it's a completely different game. So I think you have to get the, you know, it's better to play from ahead, obviously, all the time, but especially against Stanford. KJ Costello is a way better quarterback. Um, I think there's going to be some mismatch potential problems. We've seen this USC secondary give up a lot of big plays. Um, so, I, yeah, there's a... I don't know. I'm not sure how this one is going to go. Uh, I don't remember Shotgun's prediction. Chris, what were your predictions for your five? You did the five call. Like, you did pretty well against UCLA, right? Yeah, that was my best uh, performance, if we want to call it. Okay. My best writing performance. <laughs> I went four for five, which, yeah, that's the most I've ever gotten. The nice. only one I didn't get was the Jack Jones interception. Um, I got the Stephen Carr going over. And Jack Jones was this close on that deep ball that bounced off his hand, off the helmet, and right through Jordan Lesnar. <laughs> so came, I flirted with it, the perfect, but I got the Stephen Carr going over 60 yards. Valus busting a kickoff past 50 yards, which I'm still counting even though the penalty brought it back. Yeah, he still did it. Okay. I like and that. I can't remember the other ones, but I got them. So I got to do something special for the Pac-12 championship. Maybe I'll throw in a, a bonus one. Okay. Maybe um, we could have fans like write in and say what they want you to predict. Sure. <laughs> that, yeah, that doesn't... <laughs> they, they tweet them things like, hey. Suggestions. You know, you can always I want you to predict. Give you know, suggestions. Something. Um, Eddie says, how much pressure is on Helton now that Chip Kelly is coaching at UCLA? Wait, Chip Kelly? Uh, who's that? <laughs> it is 27 minutes into the show before <laughs> Chip Kelly was mentioned. So. Bravo, everybody. <laughs> I mean, there's no pressure on him right now. I mean, Chip Kelly's not doing anything. Now, <laughs> Chip Kelly is now starting to recruit. That's where the pressure will be, yeah. which will be after this game, when USC starts hitting the road and making those in-home visits and stuff. I mean, UCLA got, Chip Kelly got his first commit yesterday, I believe. Today, um, I think, right? Or a maybe. guy that, that USC had just offered, uh, running back. Um, I'm uh, blanking uh, on the name, Allen. Casimir Allen. Casimir Allen, yeah. So, you know, Usually goes after him and gave him an offer, I believe, yesterday, and he committed, uh, you know, on the spot or you know, not too long after. So now you'll see the recruiting war start to to heat up, I think, because I think Chip Kelly is going to really focus on the Southern California athletes rather than Jim Mora style of going to Texas, you know, a lot, going across the country and finding different guys where the USC was not really recruiting as much. All right. Sean and Adam have similar questions. Sean says, "Is T. Martin leaving to Tennessee?" And Adam says, who would you want as OC if T leaves? Okay, I'll field this. My whole household is <laughs> football for the last couple of weeks. Um, according to our sources, uh, so we talked to T. Martin this week. Uh, he was not talking about any kind of jobs. A lot of the Tennessee fan base would love to bring T. Martin back, and it's been a, a, basically a cluster. Their coaching search, if you saw Sunday, where Vol Twitter blew up the Greg Schiano hire, um, which was Insane, but you know, the mob spoke and uh, they did not. They backed John Curry, the athletic director, backed off that. Um, Mike Gundy was talked to. There's a bunch of guys they talked to. Uh, Jeff Brom was the rumor this morning. Bruce Feldman saying they're not really close, so you know, it's still a possibility there. Um, from what I've understood, they've not contacted T Martin yet, so uh, it might get to that point. How toxic of a job is this now? It's still obviously a, a very high profile job. It's probably going to turn some people away, but I think there's other people that will be uh, still attracted to it. North Carolina State's uh, head coach is one they just talked to, I guess. Um, I think T. Martin still could be a factor. My guess is overall, though, that T. Martin's not going to be uh, around USC next year. 
Um, and my guess for who replaces him, I the easiest thing to do is for Clay Helton to bump up Tyson Helton, his brother, and just let him be the offensive coordinator. If I had to guess, T. Martin leaves for something, and Tyson Helton becomes the offensive coordinator. That would that would be my guess. Do you want? Would you suggest that Helton should be the offensive coordinator? Would I? Say, are you just trying to get me in trouble? <laughs> I, I, maybe I ask the tough questions. Right? I don't know enough about like I like Tyson a lot. Like when we talk to him, I think he's very straightforward, and I do like he came from like a Jeff Brom coaching tree. So I think he's closer to like someone that's been. I always like the guru trees. Like I think Chip Kelly is like the, the you know the tip of a guru tree. You know, and he's had disciples kind of below him. He's learned from other people too, but. He was an innovator, and I think Brom, you can consider Brom as one of those guys that has got this offense that he kind of owns and, and created himself, and Tyson kind of learned from him. Um, so I, I think there's some potential there. I just don't know enough about him. He wasn't the play caller when he was at Western Kentucky. I would rather have USC have a very experienced offensive coordinator play caller. So, you know, loved what they did with Dylan McCullough, bringing in someone from the outside. I, you know, if they could do that again, I think it would be great, but I just don't know enough about, um, and you know, we've seen Tyson Helton, it seems like he calls third down plays. USC was like, what, two of 10 on third down against uh, uh, against UCLA, not great on third down. They were great the first time they played Stanford, 10 of 12 on third down. But since then it's been a steady, or a very steep drop off. It's not been a good third down team. So I don't know. Yeah. Yumi says, hello from Washington State. I came down to watch the game against UCLA. It was already a closer game than we expected. Are we ready for a big game against Stanford? I'm kind of worried about Sam. A while back, he said he lost his confidence. Does he believe him in himself that he's ready to fight against Stanford? I love to see my SC to dominate the football again. Don't know what the question was in there. <laughs> I don't know. Chris uh, USC is ready. Play yes. a big game. Chris yeah. Hawkins said yes. Trust us. I think this could be a, a really nice uh, Sam Darnold game. Classic. Uh, big game performance from him. This is his first Pac-12 championship well, that he's played in. Um, he's been playing really, really well uh, since that slump in the middle of the season. So he's got his confidence with his receivers, got a little bit of a rest to mentally uh, reset. I think it could be a big day for a uh, number 14. So right. I think they're ready. Nice. He said he rested his arm for the whole bye week. So he said his arm felt really crisp this week. So that helped. It's just like some Call of Duty or something. That was about it. <laughs> Maybe he's playing with Juju. Feely, <laughs> oh, nice. I think that's how you say your name. Pac-12 against other conferences, especially the SEC and Big 12. How are we in comparison? I don't think we get the same respect. Why? It's not as good. Because they <laughs> haven't been as good recently. I yeah. mean, the team that went to the playoff last year, Washington, you looked at that Washington team, you said, this team has a bunch of holes in it. I mean, especially a quarterback. Jake Browning's not that great. No. I, don't, I don't think so. In my USC opinion. beat them at home last yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, and kind of dominated that game. Um, you know, USC, if, if they were the if the Pac-12 had a team like the USC teams of your the the Pete Helton, I mean the Pete Carroll, um, <laughs> uh, super coach. <laughs> he's friendly and he's energetic and everything. Um, so if, if they had those teams, then then you get the respect. But as a conference overall, there's a lot of good teams, but there's been no great teams, which I think is why the Pac-12 has not got that respect. Now, do other team the other conferences, you know, are they? You know, resting on the laurels, kind of. The SEC at last year was terrible. Besides Alabama, I mean, this year Auburn has been pretty good. They've shown the last month. Georgia was pretty good. We'll see how they play in the in the rematch with Auburn. Alabama, are they good? Question mark. I mean, they're kind of you know going off reputation a lot. They haven't really beat anyone this season. Um, and then the big big tw uh, Big Ten, you see the sim similar thing where you know there's some good teams, but I don't know if there's really a great team in that conference either. Um, so I think the the conference as a whole, the Big Ten, has declined a bit their, their reputation this year. Uh, so you know I think it, it all depends on how the teams play, and, and the Pac-12 teams haven't been great recently. So I think that's part of the reason why you see those other uh, conferences get a little more respect right now. Now if USC and Washington become those top tier programs three, four, five years in a row, then you'll see the Pac-12 as a whole get more respect as well. I think hiring Chip Kelly certainly helps um, bringing in guys like that. They had a, a great coaching resurgence in 2012. One of those guys is gone, Todd Graham. You know, you bring in like a Kevin Sublin. Don't bring in Herm Edwards, Arizona State. That's the worst. Um, Big great quotes, though. Yeah. Oh, geez. Like, that's just, just awful. <laughs> Plus, like, we can play that you play to win the game clip so over awful. and over. Like, why would you do Like, that just makes no sense. But for, for the Pac-12 in general, 
a lot of it starts from the top, unfortunately. And I, I do the Pac-12 podcast. If you go to Pac-12podcast.com, Dave Woods and I, who covers UCLA for Bro, I mean, we talk about this a lot. Why why do no no Power 5 team get so get understand this? No Power 5 team in the country had a bye week in November, except Pac-12 teams. And five of them had a bye week in November. That's not setting your programs up. And we know three of them already lost, and two of them look like absolute dog crap. So you're not helping yourself. You're not helping yourself by sending a premier program on the road two weeks in a row, one of them uh, on a Friday night where you're six games apart. There's so many things that Pac-12 does that does not help the people at the top. And you want to talk about that's how you get judged. It's not about, hey, you got nine bowl teams, which the Pac-12 does. You're talking about, you want to talk about Alabama or Ohio State or, or Penn State or whatever. You want to talk about the teams at the top. And the Pac-12 put their teams at the top in way worse positions than some, the SEC would never do that to Alabama. So I think the Pac-12 needs to do that. And screw all the parody stuff. If you want to be nationally recognized, you have to let your teams at the top excel. Don't have to help them. You just don't want to hinder them. That's my rant. Okay. And I agree with that. <laughs> I like the Thanks. little sound effects at the end. <laughs> um, Sean says, is there any chance USD can get the Pac-12 to change the championship game to somewhere where people, people actually want to go? It's, it's set up to go to Vegas. So at, when, when they open their stadium, it looks like everyone I've talked to seems like that's going to happen. So, yeah. Um, we, just, we just saw a tweet from uh, Dave Lombardi, who used to be with, with Scout at uh, – at the bootleg, and I, I forget who he writes for now. He was writing for ESPN and somebody else now, but um, I think I think he's actually he might be back there at the bootleg. But they have the tarps for the top level of the Pac-12 championship game covered. And you're talking about one of the teams is in town, like Stanford. So and they're still not going to be able to do that. So yeah, I think Vegas would be a better option. Well, Stanford also does not travel well at all. Um, but travel Vegas, it's 12 miles. Uh, they don't. They don't <laughs> travel to their own stadium, yeah. uh, which is why they, you know, took out a bunch of seats. You know, not too long ago, the renovation was a very smart idea by them. Yeah, um, I like their stadium. Yeah. The, the Pac-12 seems to really like Vegas. I mean, the basketball tournament is there. Uh, you know, and, and the basketball tournament is is more uh, more attended there than it was when it was in Staples Center uh, for for the basketball tournament. So I think that's definitely a place to look. Um, at maybe even get a rotation. You know, potentially between there, Levi's, and the the new stadium in L.A. Um, and you know, if the Pac-12 doesn't like it, you can just tell them to, to basically go go suck it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> wow. I don't think the Pac-12 network should be in San Francisco either. You have the entertainment capital of the world in Los Angeles. Like, why is the network Seems not here? And everything costs more up there. Now, it's way so. more expensive, <laughs> and you have talent everywhere here for television. Like, probably it, just Larry Scott's. It's literally like he place. wants to drive across whatever. So. All right. Carlos asks, what's going on with Jamel Cook? Uh, Chris, you want to talk? Or? We now enter the Twilight Zone. Academics? <laughs> shrug. That's what we were told. I like the shrug. Yeah. I asked, yes, that was, we had one last question on Monday, and I asked, there was like, no one had asked yet. Because, like, he's a tall dude. Like, you he's thought he could match up well against, like, the Texas receivers or Stanford's tall receivers. He's... You know, he's hanging out with Porter Gustin somewhere. I don't know. There's this mystery. He didn't, yeah. He wasn't even there. Well, so. then, and when um, Helton talked about, he was praising how special teams is such a great avenue for players who are young to get experience, yada, 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 which begs the question, then why don't we see Jamel Cook there? That is the biggest mystery. Why is he not playing cornerback? Because he gets beat in practice. And he, he's not ready there. He, he's, you know, making the transition from safety to nickelback in the spring to now playing corner. Why he's not playing at corner, I understand. It doesn't, it doesn't look like he's ready. Everyone else gets beaten practice. <laughs> they get beaten games. <laughs> like what? Also that, true, but you're not. I, I don't not think he's, your argument, I don't so think I he's ready to play cornerback. All right. Um, I think he still has work to do there, and maybe you know he'd be available next year. You know, for that. Why is he not on special teams? I don't understand this at all. You want to put Jake Russell? You know, walk on wide receiver, and, and good for these guys for getting opportunities. But Grant Moore, former walk on, you, you got all uh, Corbin Junties played on on special teams. Like all these, why can Jamel Cook not get in there? It doesn't make any sense at all, unless he's in. He's basically in USC purgatory. He's yeah. he and DeAnthony Melton are hanging out, uh, <laughs> waiting for you know some decision to be made. Uh, different decisions here, but you know he's not getting an opportunity when he you know that should be a place where he should be on. 
I also think somebody like Josh Amorabebe should be on special teams as well. Yeah. You know, a, and both those guys are athletic freaks. Give them a chance to make an impact in another way, um, and, and they're not getting those chances. Yeah. Sean says, what has caused the team to look so inconsistent this year? Just injuries, question mark? Okay, I have a little mini rant because... Oh. Oh, here we go. I don't understand why. Put, put Keely back on. All right. Oh, sorry. I did Deontay Burnett, like, catching. Like, we haven't talked about <laughs> Deontay Burnett, so I just put a picture of him. Deontay Burnett, like, okay. Diving, catching a ball against Stanford. The shotgun toe. This is an inexperienced team. And with inexperience comes inconsistency. I'm going to go through the starting lineup of the last game, and we'll see who was the starter last year. Chuma Doga. Not really. Chad Wheeler. Sort of. Andrew Voorhees. No. Freshman. Nico Falla. Yeah. Chris Brown. No. Tolo Badon, not a left tackle. Deontay Burnett. And only for one game for Tolo. Yeah. Deontay Burnett didn't play a full season as a starter. Sam Darnold also didn't play a full season as a starter, if we want to be fair. Ronald Jones, okay. Also he, also didn't play a full season as a starter. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Daniel Monreve. Also didn't play a full season as a starter. Tyler Vons. Didn't play at all. Michael Pittman. Barely played at all. Let's go to defense, shall we? Josh Fatu. Didn't play a full season as a starter. Jordan Iceva. Didn't play. At a different position than also he started. Also at a different position. <laughs> Cameron Smith at Mike. Full time. Well, that's true. Different different position. Jack Jones? Didn't play. Uh, Marvel Tell. Starter. Uh, Leon McQuay, though? Uh, the three safeties, they both started. Didn't play okay. a full season as a starter. Rasheem Green. Didn't play a full season as a starter. You trying to do Did play a full season. Sort of, sort of. Okay, we'll give it One. <laughs> John Houston. No. Yvonne Marshall. Yes. Two. Chris Hawkins. Didn't play a full season as a starter. A Jane and Nickel. Didn't play a full season as a starter. There yeah. you go. <laughs> two two full time. But a lot of those dudes played a lot that okay, were like. Okay, but like, I, I, mean, I, I sort of, Keely. sort of, <laughs> but still, these are inexperienced guys, and if you're going to expect, I feel like they're expecting a ton of experience from guys that just simply aren't experienced. I mean, what this happens at every program. I, I'm, I every know, team has I'm just turnover. saying. It is week 14 now. Yes, I'm just saying. So they, they got a whole year under their belt. Okay. Oh. She ain't saying. She's just saying. I know. No, I like your rant, Keely. That's cool. I, Chris, you know, you, you got to step it up. You got 18 minutes left to, to come up with a rant. We're all, we're, <laughs> Who everyone else is going on one. Jamel Cook, not oh, right. special teams. Oh, right. yes, yes, yes. Get him on special teams. <laughs> come okay. on. Um, let's see. But, okay, that's not making excuses. I'm just saying that if you're young and inexperienced, there's going to be inconsistency. There's a, a lot of other things, injuries, coaching, Yada, yada, yada. I'm just saying. That's a thing. Okay. Um, you're like, get over it. Um, <laughs> no, we love you. Patrick role. says, why don't you think we won impressively against Colorado and UCLA? Coaching? I feel like that could have at least helped us rank over Penn State. Um, I do. So I do think, if you people are talking about the rankings and all that kind of stuff, they, they, I don't worry about the rankings all that much, but a lot of people do. I think if USC looked better in a lot of those games that they won, they could be ranked higher. You could be, you know, a high ranked two loss, you know, two loss team. Um, obviously, losing to Washington State, getting crushed by Notre Dame, really is hurt because that's a team that's kind of fallen off too. So they, they peaked against USC for whatever reason. Uh, but I think that the eye test, USC is not passing it for a lot of the voters when they watched. Um, why is that? Um, I think there's a lot of self-inflicted wounds. I think there's, you know, coaching certainly been an issue. Keeley talked about. The lack of experience. I think there's a lot of things that are kind of at play there, but um, I think USC is talented enough. There's a lot of reasons they should have played better than they have in a lot of those games. I don't know what you guys think, but I mean, we've mentioned it before. They go through these weird, just mental lapses in games where they just look uninspired and like we're up 21 points. Let's put in this touchdown, end it all. Oh, <laughs> interception or three and out, and then team comes back and scores 14 straight, yeah. and now it's the game again. So that's kind of what we saw against Colorado. Gave up the two big plays. It's back to a, a close one a little bit. Same thing with UCLA. If not for two turnovers in the red zone, you know, what's going to happen? That they might lose that game also, or for a fake punt too. They just yeah. like excitement, obviously. <laughs> they just want you guys to be invested in the game instead of, you know, it's late Saturday night because USC has to play all these late games and you, yeah. you want to start drinking at halftime. No, they want you to be invested and pay attention for the full – Full, uh, full time of the game. Also, yeah. I don't think the, the college football playoff committee is even paying attention to them because if you look at their comments, they're like, oh, yeah, they've been playing really well recently. <laughs> and you're like, they've been yeah. playing okay. They've been winning, but really yeah. well. Like They're like, oh, they, only, they have these two. Like, 
their comments just did not sync with it. So it seems like they're like, uh, well, if all these other teams play, then we'll go back and rewatch the game. I got a DVR. So yeah. until then, I don't really care about that team at all. So it seems like they're like, that's, that's a late night game. I'm not staying up for that. <laughs> right. Kirby Hocutt's like, I got to worry about this Cliff Kingsbury guy and whether we can get to a bowl game ever. Not, do, I, do I fire? Do, it's like, oh, wait, I got to do this college football playoff thing too? Oh. And, it, you know, and it's unfortunate USC has only beaten three teams that have winning records this year. So that's another part of the problem is that you thought Western Michigan won 12 games last year. They were 6-6. Six and six, And USC's tied with them in the fourth quarter. So that doesn't help. You know, Texas, uh, you know, they're 6-6. They're six and six, You know, they're just, they're, there's teams that you thought might be a little bit better that weren't. So it doesn't exactly help your resume. And USC's marquee games were all earlier in the season. And those yeah. teams haven't turned out to be great, so nobody's still talking about them. This, yeah. the, the, the Texas, the Stanford game early. I mean, Stanford loses immediately to, to San Diego State after that, and you don't really pay attention to them, right. even though they've played really well recently. Now, now there's a little bit, oh, that was a really good win for USC. But, you know, those early wins that were kind of marquee wins are no, no longer marquee wins. And the big chance they had on the national stage, we talked about it leading into the game at Notre Dame, is like, this is your chance to... Get some Heisman votes. This is your chance to say, say, hey, we need to be in the top ten, even though, or the top five, or whatever, even though we lost to Washington State previously. Oh, there's all these mitigating circumstances there. You go to Notre Dame and you get, you know, boat race. Then, you know, that you lose your opportunity to yeah. make those those statements and those claims and kind of fight for yourself. One thing we didn't talk about too, real quick. Stanford had to go to Australia to start the season, so rough. That, that they like they flew to life Australia, life. and I had people write in. I think in the podcast, you're like. Yeah, I did that after college, and I was 21 years old, and I wasn't right for a month, you know. And what happened when they came back? They lost to USC, and they lost to San Diego State. So I think it's definitely going to be a different Stanford team. It's another aspect where, like, yeah, hey, this is a team that won the North, and they had to go to Australia to start the season and then play the, you know, the, the favorite in the conference on the road. Like, that's, that's not how you treat your best teams in the conference. Yeah, well, obviously the Pac-12 wanted to, you know, <laughs> do them right. Oh, they're going to contend for the Pac-12 North. Well, we'll see about that. Go to Australia and then play <laughs> USC, like, on the road. Like, oh, they did have, sense. like, 14 days. They had a bye week. Yeah, they did. Have, like, you cancel that out for jet lag. Yeah. Armand Hawkins, friend of the show, hey, and Armand. father of Chris Hawkins, says, are, you, are the USC fans going to show up and support the team or just yell at the TV and scream on the boards to fire the coaches? Uh, the latter. <laughs> I'm amazed at how many comments we get during games because uh, I, I don't see the message board at all during the game and then I'll peek at it because there's just so, like I'll like go, oh, it's three, four, five, sometimes it's like six pages of, of random comments during the game. And a lot of them are ridiculous and people, you know, they're brought back to the top after the game. People are like, you were crazy for, for thinking <laughs> this that. in the first quarter. Um, but it's amazing me how many comments there are and it just shows that, you know, not everyone can make it to a game, especially with some of these late night games. So you're going to see people that are on the message boards and, and screaming at the TVs. Uh, if you can't make it to a game, then that's the best thing to do. Get on the peristyle. Yeah. Chris, what have you thought, like, going from when we merged the sites, the 247, that, like, is the peristyle kind of crazy, like, when you're looking at that stuff? I, I mean, I still, there's a lot more people talking on the thing. And uh, sometimes when the game gets a little bit, Close. I kind of shut the. I'm back. I just back out. Smart. Yeah. I just. I'm Homer Simpson. Just backing into the, <laughs> the weeds. Um, but the peristyle is great. I love peristyle. <laughs> but but Armand, yeah, like uh, your son kind of addressed it a little bit. A um, lot. A lot. I, it's it's amazing how divided the fan base is. That if you didn't want Helton to be hired, it doesn't matter what he does. Like. Win in ten games twice in a row, you know, two years in a row. He, they don't care. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just the way the kind of the fan base is right now. There's and there's other people that are like, whoever the coach is is the best coach that's ever lived, and then you know he's the greatest. And if and they root against Chip Kelly because anyone that was gonna be hired or potentially could have been hired when Clay Helton was hired, they're terrible. So they're gonna. It's it's amazing how like they're gonna. They made a stand like a couple years ago, and that's where you're gonna stay for the rest of your life. So. And also, there's going to be a lot of people yelling on their TVs because it's Friday. Yeah. It's a Friday game, so not everybody can make it up there. I mean, everybody can take off I'm, work. I'm and not gonna, five, Friday yeah, I'm not begrudging people that can't, like, hey, you live in Los Angeles and work and have a job. I'll be on a Friday and be at 5 o'clock at Levi State. Like, you basically have to take Friday off, like, to get up there. There's no other way to do it. So I'm not, to not support for this game, you know, I'm not going to 
You but if you are crazy. working, take a half day, fly out right <laughs> after. Oh Even if you tried to do that, like, it would be very difficult to make it by kickoff. You took a half day and you were living in Los Angeles, it would be hard. We're so. leaving, a, our flight is 11.50, so it can happen. Make it happen, guys. Get there. Someone suggested Norm Chow for offensive coordinator. Stop. <laughs> he will destroy this. <laughs> Good. Um, Just no. Stop that. Patrick Lee says, if we win the Pac-12, do you think this season was still a disappointment? I do, but what do you think Lynn Swan thinks? I don't agree with that. You win the Pac-12, that's not a disappointment. Like, you haven't done it since 2008. Like, that's a nice step, winning the Pac-12. Yes, top four or five to start the season. You want to make the college football playoff. But I think if you go, you win the Rose Bowl, and especially if you win, like, the Fiesta Bowl, no. I'm going to say, like, I've been as big a complainer about a lot of the stuff that's been going on all year as anybody. But I'm not going to, like, ignore the fact that you won, went 11-2 and won the Pac-12. So I say no. What do you guys think? I mean, there's still two games to go. I mean, you yeah. you got to win the Pac-12 championship, then you got to win the bowl game, then it's a success to me. You uh -huh. know, with how much hype and the quarterback that you have, I think it is a bit of a disappointment. Now, there were holes. So we knew that. Uh, maybe their national media voting them fourth overall to begin the season didn't know that. But I think that this team has not progressed the way last season's team progressed once Sam Darnold took over. I think that's one of the biggest disappointments this year. Um, so if you don't win these last two games, yeah, I'd say it's a bit of a disappointment. What do you think, Chris? I mean, he kind of hit the nail on the head right there. I mean, based off everything that was going on preseason, uh, everyone had a feature about Sam Darnold out every week. Uh, top five ranking, going to the playoff, concerning what you did last year. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of a disappointment that you're probably not, you're not going to the college playoff. But you win the Pac-12 title, you, all the people who think you should be in the playoff, you're going to get your chance to see what USC could do against a playoff caliber team in the yeah. Fiesta Bowl against Ohio State or uh, Oklahoma or uh, Miami or whatever. Even Alabama, maybe. Yeah. They yeah. Don't get in. I think that's a key point is it will be like I thought earlier like oh maybe you get like a UCF without their head coach like I think it's going to be like one of these like just miss the playoff yeah. teams too and it could be Ohio State so then it's like you're going to get a playoff caliber team so most likely in the Fiesta Bowl. I, I personally want it to be Miami so Jack Jones can bring his own turnover chain. Ah <laughs> nice. Wow. I like that. Hot takes. All right. Hot takes. Um... That also kind of says uh, how many playoff caliber teams there are because there's everyone has flaws this year there's no there's dominant a lot of flawed team. teams yeah so there's a lot of teams that are this season are playoff caliber where were the the six to eight teams this year are playoff caliber would they be playoff caliber last year maybe one or two at the top yeah they, might have been. it was a better group last year yeah. for sure we're kind of running out on questions really um, nice man we got some over here well, well, we got, okay. okay we haven't talked about here i'm going to put them up there rojo ronald jones so <laughs> Um, he had over 100 yards in this game uh, earlier in the year, and uh, Stephen Carr did as well. Um, obviously, he's been playing really well. What are you guys' thoughts on Rojo? I, th I think he's going to have to have a huge game for USC because it's not like a great Stanford run defense. Didn't have as good of a game as I thought he should have had, or USC in general, against UCLA. I think they got to fix that somehow and, and get this run game going. I mean, he's the key. I mean, you give him give him some space and let him break some tackles. I mean, he's going to make guys miss. I mean, that's one of the things he's done so well this season, you know, breaking arm tackles and just juking guys as well. Uh, if you can get – I mean, Stephen Carr has played seven, five, and seven offensive snaps the last three weeks since he's come back. If you can get him back to where he was early in the season – I mean, he played 31 against in the Texas game. Uh, before taking over in the Cal game, he played 46, obviously, but Ronald Jones not there. If you can get him back to 20, 25 play snaps in there as well. I mean, they did such a good do job in that Stanford game when I was re-watching it of using all four of the guys. And, and Clay talked about, oh, now we got all four back healthy. But you saw Akin Cedric Ware with some six, eight-yard runs. You saw uh, Vi Malapai do the same thing. Um, you know, those guys can get in there and can also pound on the defense, and that's something that USC never really let up. You know, they kept pounding on that Stanford front and were able to get big yardage and big chunks. And it was the first time they kind of used that two-back set. Maybe we'll see some of that again now with everybody healthy. Yeah. But I think Ronald Jones is obviously the forefront of that. And maybe you don't have to use him as much as you have in the last couple games, even though you can. But, you know, if you can switch it up and use Carr out of the backfield and, and not just as a – because basically he's just been a receiving weapon the last couple of weeks. It's like they put him in, I think he's got one or two carries the last couple of weeks, yeah. and the rest of the time has been you're going to throw it to him automatically. Yeah. He's, I like seeing him being thrown to. He's just such a di different weapon for USC, 
and it's interesting to see maybe next year when he's fully that guy how explosive he'll be for USC. Um, question though, do you think this might be Ronald Jones' last game for USC? Yes. Everyone's nodding their head. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I cut the dreads off too. I know. I was very. I didn't recognize him. It was very strange. Yeah, I was sitting next to him, and I'm like, "You look different." You know, like what's going on? <laughs> but it's not shaved because when he shaved his head off, he said he was kind of like Samson lost his power. So oh. we'll see where he's at. You know, hopefully, he's not at like half strength now because he half shaved it off. Uh, Kenny says, why do you think Rojo doesn't get as much love on the national stage? Rojo was actually asked about this uh, after the Colorado game. He was asked, do you think you're underrated nationally? And he said, he's like, no, I think I think I get my due. But I don't actually agree with that. I think he's underrated. Um, he's on the West Coast. Bryce yeah. Love doesn't even really get his due. Yeah. And he's, Bryce, I mean, he, he, he gets more. Um, you know, Rojo got hurt kind of in the middle, too. And it's like, once you have, like, like if, if Oklahoma is a great running back, um, you're still talking about Baker Mayfield. Like, it's just kind of like, you're not talking about Stanford's quarterback, you know? So it's, I think it's one of those things for the running back. It's like, you have the superstar quarterback, you really got to shine. So uh, him l- missing a couple games, and then USC kind of getting away from it sometimes. I think there's games where they didn't use him enough. I mean, he's getting 15 carries. Like, he, he didn't get over 20 carries a whole lot a couple of times, right? Um, if he did that more, then maybe you get more recognition. Are you saying that Trace... Arm punt McSorley is not a star quarterback. No, he's he's a name, but he has a lot of arm punts, and you're you know so you see you look at the running backs more. You know, uh, it's not you know, Keller Christ is not someone that's like scaring you. Is all about. It's very you know, rare that you're going to talk about multiple uh, stars on one side of the ball for a team. It's hard. Sam Darnold, like Chris said, there's a feature written about him every other day. So. Um, Rojo's special, and I think he's going to get dra- like he'll be drafted high. It'll be fine. I think he'll be fine. Um, but I don't. I see him going. I don't think we've seen too many USC guys leave way earlier than well, not leave earlier than they should have a year early. Um, just for like a Damian Mama from last year. I, I kind of get the feeling the guys like uh, Cam Smith and Porter Gustin and Iman Marshall. I think they're going to stay. Um, and for per- per- performance reasons. You know, it's hard with Gustin and Marshall being hurt a lot, and Marshall and not playing that well. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, oh, he did play really well in the UCLA game. I feel like Rashawn Green could be the Damien Mama of this year. I don't know. He's really good. He's well, good. Yeah. He, okay. Uh, yeah. Not that he's bad, but he could be, not. I don't know. He don't could know. be a good combine guy too. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> he could. Yeah. Like Damien Mama ran a, like a seven second forty yard dash. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's not fair. That's not fair to to Rashawn Green. I take it back. Which Tyson almost caught it. <laughs> Which was, yeah, it was like the slowest one uh, um, like ever. People are calling for predictions and scores. Sunny says I have to give a a score. I can't just predict who's gonna win. Man. I'm being called out. Oh, Sunny, we're, yeah. So we usually wrap it up in about an hour. So I guess we could start doing that. I like you guys said. I don't really know what to expect. Like, would I be shocked if USC came out and played kind of like they did in the first game and played well and gets a lead and, you know, I, I really wouldn't be. But would I be shocked if, like, Stanford came out and was just, like, torching, you know, throwing the ball well on the outside, Bryce Love getting a lot of huge plays and the, and the you know, defense having trouble tackling, turnovers. I, I wouldn't be shocked at that either. So I don't know. I mean, my guess is USC wins a really, really close one. I'm going to say, like, 30 to 28. So how's that? So I think Stanford covers the three or four points, but USC wins a close one. How's so, that? So, Josh asks, what kind of podcast do you think you'll be doing? Emergency or reverse emergency? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I hope it's not an emergency. Like, those are tough. Um, no, I don't, I don't think i got to do an emergency one this week. But if USC loses, I'll predict, if USC loses, I'm going to have to do, like, five emergency podcasts because <laughs> all the people that were, like, mad at USC for being 10-2, and two, they don't win the Pac-12. It's going to be, you know, anarchy. So... There, it's this is to me this is a huge, huge game. The fans like and for Clay Helton, you want to talk about pressure on Clay Helton? If he loses this game, he'll have pressure on him for sure. He's got pressure no matter what. But if you lose, if you lose sure. this game, he'll still have the same amount of championships as Lane Kiffin and Steve Sarkeesian. True. Uh, Chris, okay, we go through your guys' predictions. Chris, what do you got? Um, I'm kind of playing this one close to the vest. Until my predictions. Oh, oh he's Kirk Herbstreit. Oh. Someone call out Kirk Herbstreit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
call Chris for this? Why do I get called <laughs> well, he on does He's got a prediction. <laughs> he's got a long-standing column that he continues. Let me just have a moment to call him out. Uh, or, me? Uh, no. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. Okay. I feel like the only way USC loses this is if they beat themselves. Like turnovers oh. or sloppy play. But David Charles is smart, so... At times. I keep going back and forth He's a this. really smart guy that does some dumb things sometimes. <laughs> really smart guy. Don't we all, though? Um, yeah. I don't know. I think USC wins by a touchdown. Wow. Here's my score, Covers everyone. the spread. Okay. So I think 28-21 USC. All right. No field goals for that. Keeley. Shaka, what do you think? Maybe 24-28. I don't know. Sorry. I was just about to say 28-24. <laughs> Well, that, now you're talking about the spread, Stanford. so that's a big difference. No, nope, Stanford wins. Sta oh. oh! So definitely covering the spread from Shaka. We'll see. What did you say? What if they you come say? out fresh, we'll see. What did you say in practice? I asked Shaka on, like, straight up what you're I said it earlier. I said that I know, but they could either, they would get behind, and they would make it close, No, and the they would first lose. thing you said, you and had a, like, said, gut reaction. Or they'll come out fresh, and they'll dominate up front. It's Your gut reaction is that USC lost. So. That's what I just said. I know, I was just putting it out. Your gut reaction as well. Okay, I just said exactly what I said in practice. Okay, okay good for the job. the second time. Good job. Ow. Chops. You Alex says, this. come on, Chris, prediction. <laughs> What's that? Alex says, come on, Chris, prediction. <laughs> okay. He's got to call him like, You can say he the spread or something if you want or what. I don't know. I think. Uh, he thinks you should read his column later in the week, obviously. Obviously. 35-28 USC. Oh, nice. Okay. So covering. <laughs> Chris pretty confident. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Going back and forth. Right now. It's hard. It's just you just don't know what to expect. And I don't like the fact that these teams that have November bye weeks haven't looked good. Uh, now maybe they practiced. Could, Shotgun's like poo pooing that. Oh, I don't think that matters. You don't think it matters. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, like I think you, you want your bye week in like the you know I beginning think of October. But you you got to look at other factors. Like Cal's just not a good team. Washington State has been terrible in the Apple Cup. I mean, Chris Peterson has dominated that series the entire time. I'm I mean. Also been flat. In big games. Colorado's not a good team, so that they lost after their bye week, it's not surprising because they lost before their bye weeks, too. But they didn't look like crap like that. Like, they, I mean, they looked their worst. So I'm just saying, like, could it be a factor that, you know. And also, what I think one of them was playing against Oregon, who had Justin Herbert back. Who Oregon with Justin Herbert has been a really good team. Yeah. Uh, which should scare some USC fans for the future, especially if Taggart doesn't go to Florida State. Yeah. Though he should. Looks like Oregon. Uh, it looks like Oregon's stepping up for to try to keep Willie Taggart, giving him more money and stuff. So that whole coaching carousel. I know if you're a USC fan, it's affecting you. Like it's certainly Chip Kelly's going to affect you as a USC fan. Whoever Arizona State hires will affect you. And you know Willie Taggart. USC doesn't play him next year, but they could certainly be a power in the Pac-12. Hey, even if USC loses this game, USC fans should be thankful that they're not Tennessee. That is. But that, Crazy. that <laughs> means that there's ration and, and saneness and fandom, which there's not. Also no. true, but I'm just going to put it out there. Just be glad that you're not. Tennessee. Do you guys agree with me, though? This is and really you don't have to listen to Rocky Top all the time. This, this, I like Rocky Top. And that's just because I'm married it's to awful. a ball. Um, you saying that for brownie points. That's I think this. No, I, I liked it before I knew her. Um, <laughs> the thing, I, I do think, do you guys disagree that this is a super important game for, like, Clay Helton? Because we see it, like, People are talking, like, tweeting us about replacing him. Like, and they're 10 and 2. Like, if they win the Pac-12, maybe that shuts some of those people up. But if they lose, they're going to be like, okay, so after this year when they replace it, like, it's just going to be like a foregone conclusion in their heads. Like, what do you guys think? I, I agree 100%. It's going to be really, really, really bad just from a fan perspective if they lose, especially if they get blown out. Cool. Um, I, I even thought about that. Like, <laughs> that's like not... Could still happen. Uh, but it, it's, again, we've talked about it before, is Lynn Swan, Clay Hilton is not his guy. So if he doesn't like the optics of the way the season, especially with you, you've won, but you haven't played you haven't played up to your potential. That's the biggest thing. And, and Lynn Swan is not, he's not Max Nikias. Max Nikias might be looking at wins, whereas Lynn Swan can break down X's and O's and look yeah. at it. And he say, you know what, this team could be playing better. And if he thinks that, and if they lose, he can say, you know what, I think this team could be playing better with a different coach, and suddenly that's when you get that, that uh, schism in, in the athletic department, and they look to go a different way, maybe. Yeah. Keely? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a must-win. I think, like we mentioned... Must-win. No. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the what we mentioned earlier is the fact that compared to last year, USC doesn't look like they're getting better each week. And it's funny that USC is facing Stanford again after their mo- probably their most complete game was against Stanford in week two. It's kind of a litmus test of, like, how are you doing throughout the rest of the season, which yeah. there's definite questions about that. So I think that this will be a good test to see if they can actually prove themselves and in a big game where mental factors could play a problem. And if they look really good, you say, well then you can really point at that bye week and the fact they didn't have one all season. And like, oh, if we were fresh, this is what we would have looked like sure. you could down the stretch. And you could say, oh, we would have blown out Colorado. We would have blown out UCLA because we'd have been a little bit more fresh. Or the, I mean, you could say that USC just matches well up against Stanford because they played their best game then. If they blow them out, they would have played their best game Yeah, again. but this year's team, maybe you say that, but you look, then you would look at the history of this game and the fact it's that it's been always that been a seven-point game, basically. I feel like... This game has the potential to have revisionist history if you look back on this season. If USC wins and dominates, we'll be like, why were USC fans so upset? I mean, they were 10-11-2, yeah. and, 11 and two, like blah, blah, blah. Versus if they lose and it's like, this is what we were seeing all season long. This just proves it. There's no improvement, blah, 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 blah. Right. blah. So I think it has potential to really shape the point of view of how you view this season. The entire season on this yeah. one game. And our friend Alicia for Rain of Troy wrote a nice piece uh, earlier in the week about this is basically put up or shut up. Like, yeah, you can talk about the 10 and 2, and that's fine you didn't, knowing you didn't play well. But if you lose this game, that kind of all goes away. Like, all, all that talk, like, well, they're doing, you know, we're still 10 and 2. Like, well, if you lose this game, the, the goal's gone. Like, the goal was to win the Pac-12, and it's not going to happen. So I, I think this really is kind of a a make or break game and it could like keely said shape how you think about the season like last year the defining moment of the season was one and three and it would have almost always just been one and three except for the fact that they went on a nine game winning streak and won the freaking rose bowl so that's all you're gonna think about now is winning the rose bowl you lose yeah. this one i mean i think i think this game will shape a lot of how you feel the whole season went. especially when you have another month before the next game yeah, yeah. so agreed well i guess we should probably wrap it up um, thanks. Uh, one quick question for you, Ryan. Oh, for maybe, maybe you know this a little bit better, but if USC were to lose the Pac-12 championship, what bowl will they end up going? Is it straight to the Alamo, or do, you know, does it become a question mark? Usually there's like a whole bunch of options. This year it seems like there's just two. There's Fiesta or Alamo. That's what it looks like right now. And uh, so it's you know USC has the 8-1 and one Pac-12 record. There's, there's no one like last year Colorado had that, and USC jumped them to get to a New Year's Six, like, there's nothing like that that looks like it's going to happen this year. If USC falls down to the second spot, they're not going to make a New Year's Six Bowl. They'll they'll most likely go to the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. And I'm not a big, like, like bowl projection thing. Those things are so, like, wacky, wackadoodle. But that, that seems pretty, it seems pretty cut and, you know, clear cut uh, for that. All right. Well, that's, uh, I'm going to point over there. Chris Trevino over there. Oh. I've got like, there's the pictures right next to me. <laughs> oh, I don't know what you're doing. Shotgun sprattling. I was just kind of trying to point like on the thing. Oh. And uh, Keely Yor and I'm Ryan Abraham. We're all part of this big USCfootball.com family. No one, I guarantee you, no one will have more people on the ground at the Pac-12 championship game than us. Like we might have more people than the Pac-12 has there and stuff. We're we'll be covering it. Maybe not. We'll be covering it from all angles though. No no media group will have as many people as we do. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, showing up and uh, thanks for watching us and uh, yeah enjoy two days away from uh, USC playing Stanford in the Pac-12 championship game so thanks for so much for tuning in and uh, we'll talk to you after the game <laughs>